What is going on? What is going on? What is going on, party people? It's your boy, Coach D. Brown, former big legal, former first round pick with the Kansas City Royals. I got um got a real special guest coming on today. All right. Um, real fast before I bring my man over here on. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I get the uh, you know, I get people that reach out to me and with interesting <coughs> stories and topics. And um, I feel like definitely they are something that needs to be shared. All right. I'm all about sharing information and um, helping you guys, my audience, my listeners, my followers, my people out. You know what I'm saying? So this is why I bring on the guests that I bring on to just share information and help everybody out, man. Okay. So um, one of the beauties of doing what I do, I get to pe meet people from all walks of life. So um, this young man sitting to the, sit, sitting to the side of me right here, um, you know, I met him through a mutual friend of ours online and I reached out to him. He kind of gave me a background, the story. You're going to hear it, but it all ties into what I've been talking about the last couple of days and you're going to hear it. We're going to teach you about the differences in the minor leagues and affiliate ball, independent ball. We're going to teach you about, you know, guys who really want and, and doing everything with the opportunity that they're given. You're going to, you're going to hear about dedication you're going to hear about training. You're going to hear about, um, you know, just what it takes. Okay. So now um, let me just say my shout outs to some Mr. Portridge, Manny out of Texas. What up, baby? All right. Bill Jersey, what's going on? Tony, what's going on? Sega, Louisiana, what's up? Arthur, what's up? Sterling, what's going on? New fan here. All right. I appreciate you joining. All right. Maybe you're one of your peoples over there. All right, Caleb, I'm hoping, right? Tony, what's oh, yeah. up? Jerry, what up? What's up? What's going on? All right. So now we got, so this young man over here, you know, just talking briefly with him the other day and today. Um, impressive young man, very uh, educated, on the grind. And I just, you know, when I bring these guys on, man, I just want to, I want to bring on all people from all walks of life. You get to see the coaches aspects, the college recruiting aspect. You get to see the, you get to see the, some of the minor leagues that are grinding it out. You get to see some big leaguers who have successful careers that I brought on here. Um, you see, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to continue to just help you guys and share just great stories. Okay. And just show and that's why I brought this guy. Actually, everything works out for a reason. I've been talking about dedication, what it takes to make it. Um, you're going to hear this guy's story. And I, I just think it's it all ties into, you know, basically the last two days of what I've been talking about. Like, you, I, I've been talking about guys walking away from college baseball. But, you know, the conversation I had my boy T. Sutt the other day. I've been talking about guys that I know personally walked away from um, minor league, you know, you know, real opportunities to really make the league. So, and then you got, you know, these parents and stuff on the travel ball who don't really necessarily know what it takes to make, to, to, to even be an opportunity that he, he has right now. So anyway, without further ado, I want to meet, I want you guys to meet um, Caleb Johnson. All right. Caleb is um, what we call an independent minor league ball player. Okay. And he's going to explain to it, um, explain, what that means but he's going to give his whole background story and i just want you guys to hear um just certain <clears throat> things that he's going to talk to you about about what it truly takes just for a chance just he just he's doing everything that's in his power to just get a chance to step one foot on the big in the big on a big league field okay so anyway without further ado all right i'm going to introduce my boy caleb johnson to the mix all right Caleb, if you could, man, you know, introduce yourself to the to my audience over here and, you know, just start from the beginning like I do with all my guests, man. Just start from the beginning and go all the way to where we are, where you are now, grinding it out, all right? No doubt. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? My name is Caleb Johnson. Currently, I'm uh, playing indie ball, um, just so you can know where I'm at as of right now. Um I have myself a spring training invitation to the Napa Valley Silverados over in Napa Valley, California, in the Pacific Association of Professional Baseball. 
Uh, just a little background on me. <clears throat> I was born in Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, raised down in a town called Natchez, Mississippi. It's about an hour north of Baton Rouge, two hours north of New Orleans. I'm from a small town, had some pretty good talent growing up. Um, yeah, Dee was talking about me being very educated. I don't sound like I'm from the South, mainly because of uh, my parents being professors, both of them, and um, my dad also being from Liberia. I'm a first generation American, so a lot of the dedication I have that I'm gonna be speaking on is really from the struggle that they had to have from somebody coming from a different country over to the States. Um, so I'll just start, um, I'll start with the beginning of, I was a pretty good player over in high school, used to be a catcher, being looked at by the Braves. Um, I hurt my knee my junior year. So the Braves, they said, uh, I'm not gonna look at you anymore, which is understandable because that's what they were mainly looking at me as an offensive catcher who also ran a 6'4". Um, so at that point, I possibly would have been changed into an outfielder like I was then. Graduated high school. Um, I had a couple of D1s looking at me, some junior colleges. Uh, talking about what on, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about knowledge for some of the kids who are um, in high school right now or even going into high school, especially for the parents. My uh, none of because my family came from West Africa, we really didn't know much about the recruitment process. Even though my father was a professor at a college, at a Division One college, we just knew that the colleges wanted me. However, junior college is a really good step for a lot of kids coming out. D one is not the end all be all. If you don't get D one, if you don't get drafted. I really do suggest going to a junior college. It doesn't matter if the junior college is a division three junior college, division two, or division one junior college. Every big four year school looks at junior colleges. And if you can play in junior college and survive what people call JUCO ball, you seriously can survive in any environment in baseball because they do a lot of crazy stuff <laughs> during uh, juco ball i'm actually kind of happy that i didn't go through that because <laughs> i probably wouldn't have been what people would say baseball cra baseball players are crazy i probably would have been crazier <laughs> if i went to a junior college but um <clears throat> that's just um some of the beginning of where i went of my career just on um, starting off also um the school that i went to was clark university over in dubuque iowa Usually when I say Clark, a lot of people think Clark Atlanta, but um, me being Catholic, I went to a Catholic um, university and it just worked out for me right there and also helped me out with my books. Something that a lot of kids need to understand if they ever go to college playing ball, make sure you know what you want to do with your life while you're going out playing ball for college because if something happens because we're athletes, anything can happen. You seriously could be in a car wreck the next day and you won't be able to play anymore. If you're a college athlete, I really think that you need to go to a school that piques your interest both with baseball and with whatever major that you want to go to. That's just something that I've always been, I've always learned from my parents because, ac because academics is a big thing, but we're, I was just blessed to be athletic too. Now, the school that I went to was an NAI school. I didn't go to the Division One. I. I didn't go. I had offers to the Division One, um, but just some stuff didn't work out. But I went to an NAI school. Loved it there. Um, went through two coaches. My first coach, he got he he stepped down after my sophomore, halfway through my sophomore year. Was playing pretty well. Then afterwards, my new coach came in, and then I started riding the bench more. And it wasn't anything personal against me. I just didn't fit into his plan. That's something that a lot of kids need to understand. You need to play somewhere that you can fit into somebody's plan so that you can play as much as possible. Because it is true in baseball, you can get drafted from any school. But from my experience, because I knew many cross-checkers, many, 
at the time, I didn't know what a cross checker was when I got when I graduated high school. But when I got into college, I understood that cross checkers are those guys, those are the big dog scouts that uh, that you really want to look at you. Stats do matter in college. However, stats, if you don't have the stats and you don't have the playing time, they can't do anything about it because in D can protest to this, uh, D can attest to this. Big league ball is a business, first and foremost. Doesn't matter how much somebody likes you, it's a business. Now, somebody can like you and if you're good, okay. You're good and somebody likes you, that's the best thing that can happen to you. But if they don't know who you are, but you can't even have any stats to put any weight behind what you're trying to tell the person, then there's no way that they can help you out with that. And that's po that's one of the regrets I possibly have is, um, no, it's not possibly. That's one of the regrets I do have is not going to Juco Bowl because if I did, I would have been drafted. However, I'm still playing professional ball. I'm not upset with that because God still put me in the situation. Oops, sorry about that. God still put me in the situation that I'm in and I'm very, and I'm excited about that. Now, going forward with it, as I said, I wasn't a starter after my sophomore year of college ball. Brought in some guys from junior college and they had one more skill better than mine. And I started riding the bench and I was a pinch hitter because my bat was so good, they kept me in the lineup for late innings so I could be a pinch hitter. Now, at the time, this is where adversity really comes in. When you've been a star of a team or you always are in the lineup so that you can work through your issues, it's so much easier than anybody that's riding the bench. I, um, I, I have dealt with that both in college ball and professional ball. When you fit into, I'm going to go back to the scheme of things with the coach or a manager. When you fit into the scheme of things with whatever a coach is doing, and if you are just that pinch hitter, you have to embrace it because being bitter about it will not help you, but will not help you be on the field. And I had a lot of talks with my father and uh, close friends back home. Mind you, I'm about a thousand miles away from home because I'm in Iowa and I'm coming from. Uh, southern Mississippi so because of that <laughs> that's where I have to there was a lot of times I thought I wanted to quit ball and I had to ask I had to ask in tears to friends of mine and my uh, my I have an older sister um, <laughs> just a just a mention about how my family is my dad's a physicist my mother's a nurse and my sister's a doctor I just play baseball <laughs> wow. I just play baseball. Wow. Mind you, I also have a master's right now too, but wow. that's just because my uh my grandfather, bless his heart, he um passed away and he was a missionary plus a mathematician. He got his um doctorate at um Columbia University back in the days where they didn't like uh, colored folks that much. <laughs> so wow. that was a very big accomplishment for um for my family. Wow. But wow. um I'm just on just a little bit more background on that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, going back to it, I talked with my sister in tears and I asked her, should I keep on playing? And she told me straight up that we're a family that doesn't quit. If we quit, we would have been born in West Africa with the rest of our cousins. And so after she said that, that, got, that gave me a little bit of pride right there. And that uh, got my confidence back up. And so I kept on with it. I'm going to uh, go back to the confidence thing. When you're facing adversity, it's always good to surround yourself with people who will tell you like it is, but also lift you up. It's a very fine line between what I'm saying right here, because Somebody can tell you like it is, and you're going to have to learn how to take that criticism. You're going to have to learn. I, I, I really don't know how you can take it because other because everybody's different, but you have to learn how to take criticism and learn to grow from that. 
if you can't grow from that, then that's why what D was talking about in this um in his live uh, yesterday, that's why a lot of people walk away from the game. It really is. They can't handle some of that adversity that's going on. They were the best at some of these things. I had friends, and there's some of my best friends at the beginning during the fall when I was in college. Then they're gone the next season because they decided to quit because they wanted to focus. They give me – personally, they give me excuses. If somebody walks away from the game of baseball in college and – Nobody in your family has died to give you that, to give you that, I should say, that depression. Nobody in your family has died or you haven't had a career-ending injury. To me, personally, to me, this isn't to everybody, but to me, personally, it's, it will show how soft you are for this game of ball. Because it's a, in college ball, it's a, it's a job. And I was only at the NAIA level. I have friends that were at the Division One level. And it was even worse because and when I'm talking about work, the five, I mean, four to five a.m. workouts that they have to do. After the workouts, then you have the two and a half to three to maybe possibly a four-hour long practice. And the reason why I say four-hour long practice is because that coach expects you after you do practice to do more work. It's not, we hope you do. No, they expect you to do extra work. And they'll get good grades. And I went to, I went to a, uh, I went to a private university. Where, uh, just think about it. A private university that's also Catholic. So they're not, and we're a small school, you know, they didn't really care about athletics. They worry about academics. And um, coming, because of my background, a lot of people didn't know about my background until I told them. When you go to a school in Iowa coming from the South and you're one of the minorities, and I really mean by, I was one of the very few black people at my school. It's, um, it's hard for people to try to take you seriously when you talk to them about um, about trying to help you out with schoolwork. So if you have, say, the background of what my family is or anything like that, you really have to tell the professors and your advisors to communicate with them and let them know that this is the type of family that I have. I'm not going to BS anything. Help me out with this so that we'll be able to do all this. Now I know where I'm going with this. I'm just uh, this is just for anybody who's going with, that's going to college. You really, when you're in college, especially if you're at a bigger school, you have to communicate with your advisors. You have to communicate with your professors, and if you even have to go to the dean of of undergraduates to communicate different things about what's going on, so that it will make your school life easier and fun, then. Your career, you, you, you probably won't have to worry about anything but baseball. It's the same thing of the old, the old, the old age on um, saying, work smarter, not harder. That's the way that you got to do it. All right, enough of that. So after college, my senior year, um, after my senior year, I graduated. I'm thinking, of course, I still think I'm going to get drafted. The reason why I think I'm going to get drafted because I keep on, I keep in contact with these cross checkers that I know. And I had a chance to transfer to a division one, either go to Prairie View A&M, Southern University um, down in um, Baton Rouge, or possibly University of Louisiana Lafayette. I didn't take the chance. I realized how good I was. I knew how good I was. I had to get back to how good I was again, mentally, mentally. And the cross checkers asked me if I had an extra season left and I didn't have that. So I realized how good I actually was that I still had draftability stock. So from that year that I graduated, I graduated in 2014, just to let y'all know. Graduated in 2014 and it took me a year and a half before, no, it took me a half, a half a year before I was signed to a team. And the first team that I signed with was the Trinidad Triggers over in the Pecos League. 
Now, just some um, background on what the Pecos League is. The Pecos League is a low-level independent league, and I signed with them in 2015. There, the Pecos League would be equivalent to rookie ball, and the play, the pace of play would be equivalent to low A ball. So from that, I had my first experience of um, professional ball. Now, while I was going with, with uh, in college, where if you have to face that adversity of if you have to ride the pine or not. When I first came in, I was starting, but my team was really good. Seriously, my team was the best team in the league where even though it's a hitter's league, just to give you an idea, we had over, out of 75 games, we had over 150 home runs in, as a team, and we scored over 600 runs as a team. And the guys who were there my manager wanted to trade me, but he wanted to trade me later on in, in the season. You have to also know, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back a little bit. If you get a shot at indie ball or anything with that, something that I wish I would have known, and I wish I had say an advisor, an agent, or somebody who knew more knowledge about how the game works. When you get into professional ball, it's about you. It's still about the team, and the re and there's a reason why I'm saying this. If you're not one of the main, if you're not one of the main rope, if you're not one of the main guys, or one of the starting nine every day on one of those indie teams, you might want to suggest a trade. The reason being goes back to you may not be fitting the scheme of what the manager wants, which is why you're not starting i wish i would have known that then um it's 23 years old at 23 years old that time i wish i would have known that then however i still did very well they used me more as a pinch hitter when i did start i did very well but when you have the mvp of the league that season as center field the home run champion of that of that season in left field and at the time my arm wasn't strong enough to play right field so when you have those two out of there and then when I when we pick up another guy who had a who was a lefty hitter, I'm a righty hitter, he was a lefty hitter, put put him in um right field, we have our outfield and I was one of the backups. But as a pinch hitter, this should give you an idea of how good I was and I'm actually better now just because of age. <laughs> um as a pinch hitter, I hit 700. And that's just as a pinch hitter. I don't know how many pinch hits I really had, but as a pinch hitter, I hit 700. All in all, with my regular, when I had the spot starts plus pinch hitting, my average ended up at like three, three something, like low 300s. Low 300s with like 20 something RBIs, which is a lot considering I've only had, I had, uh, a hundred. I can remember this because it's my first season. So I had a hundred plate appearances. So hundred plate appearances, eighty at bat. So with all that, just putting that all together, twenty-two RBIs with all that, just being in pinch hit situations, I was there to drive and run. I didn't really understand what they meant about me getting better. I was only worried about one thing, which was my hitting. Because I be I made myself into a one dimensional player, which is my hitting, I didn't really worry about my speed and I didn't and I just said I didn't even care. I said F my arm. If somebody keeps keeps telling you who cares about you, keeps telling you to work on something that you need to work on, and you just say F it, it doesn't matter because I'm never gonna get it better, you probably should still work on it. My father. The main one said, well, if they say that your arm, you need to get your arm better, you need to get stronger. It's like, okay, I'll try. I never put in the work like I have this season. 
this past season, I put in the work on my arm and my arm really has gone better by leaps and bounds. And I'm very surprised by it. It sucks now because I, it sucks saying it now. If I did that then, I would have been in a better position to where I'm at now. Again, I'm happy where I'm at right now. I'm still pushing forward, but I would have been in a better position um, at this point in my life. If you can do something that will help you. if So this is for all the kids out there and anybody who's also in uh, minor league ball or indie ball. If you can put yourself in a better position, if somebody's telling you you need to work on some things, because of how the internet is, and there's so many gurus that are out there with hitting, throwing, fielding, doesn't matter. Look it up on YouTube. You can Google it, you can Bing it, you can put it in Yahoo, it doesn't matter. There's so many search engines out there that you can look through so that you can know what to do. And they're all free. You don't, you really don't even have to pay for anything. You can look at it for free. It won't be the full thing, but there may be little tips, tidbits and tips in there that you'll be able to look at so that you'll be able to get what you need done. And then if you think you need to invest money into it, invest money into it. But if you don't, then apparently baseball isn't for you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to why I'm talking about the investing money thing. But I wish I would have invested in my arm earlier in my career. It's still, technically, it's still early in my career. But I would have been in a better situation. That's where really where I'm going at. Put yourself in a better situation. If somebody's telling you, and somebody who has good knowledge about things and about how the world works, try to put yourself in a um, better situation. Now, my second season I was going into for a professional ball, I uh, injured myself the second season. I uh, herniated the disc in my back. I was um, working out in the gym. Never ego lift. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> Never works out. <laughs> if you're an athlete and you see regular people lifting in the gym, never ego lift. And I mean that E-G-O, ego lift. There's a reason why they say it like that. <laughs> Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself when you should, when you tell yourself not to do that. But I herniated a disc in my back, so I was out that season. I went to spring training, I got released. And then I went to another spring training, I got released from there. It was all because of my back. Um, I couldn't really, I couldn't do anything. So I got that fixed for the next season. And I decided to go to another league called the Empire League. It's over in the Northeast. Uh, the Empire League is based out of the Northeast. Um, at the time, they only had four teams. Um, a team in Maine, um, two teams in New York, and one team in New Hampshire. I played for the team in Maine called the Old Orchard Beach Surge. Um, they're blue, if anybody's ever heard of it. Um, I got really, I went to spring training. By the way, these lower level leagues, I'm going to explain this. A lot of these lower level independent leagues, you're going to have to pay to go to spring training. It's not affiliate ball. So, I don't know about guys you have to pay, of course, to try to get yourself there, but I don't know if they get the, I don't know if they, for um, minor league spring training, if they have to pay for their hotels or anything like that. It uh, comes, it comes out of their check. They don't necessarily get paid, but yeah, they provide housing for those guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So for your housing that you're going to have to have, say in the empire league or in the, Pecos League or anything like that, you're going to have to pay for your own housing. You're going to pay for your own food. You're going to have to pay for that. However, if you make the squad, everything else will be dealt with as in host families and the check. The reason why I'm talking about the Empire and the um, Pecos is, are because they're very similar. One's on the, West Coast, on the West Coast side. The other one's on the East Coast side. They're very similar in play and pay so if you go to indie ball you should not expect to get paid a lot of money you should have a job before then before you go to spring training so that you'll be able to have money set aside and seriously i think you should do that even in minor league ball 
because I have friends in the minor leagues. I even have a friend who's in AAA. He has himself a side job while he's doing all this training. I don't know if you heard of him. His name's Blake Trayon. He got called up to the bigs this past season. But he's in AAA. I think he's going to be going to big league spring training. But even he had to have a, a job so he can have some money set aside just in case. It's always good to have money set aside just in case. Unless you're a big leaguer, then that's a different story. <laughs> but um, so of course, like I said, you had to pay for the um spring training. I went to spring training. I got released at spring training. So I went to a friend's house that was about maybe about three hours from where the spring training place was at over in Pennsylvania. This train. I was waiting for a call. I didn't get a call. I was coming back home. For some reason, I got sick. I got, like, some type of flu bug for, like, one day. No, it was, it was for a week. I had, like, the flu for, like, a week. After that happened, I got the call just when I got. So this is, all, this is how baseball works, too. If, baseball knows if you're good or if you need, if you want to end. Baseball does test you. Like you said yesterday, the baseball will test you. Really will test you. Right. Um, I I left and I'm thinking oh, I'm not gonna get the call. This was in um 2017. I'm thinking I'm not gonna get the call. Nothing's gonna happen. I, I already waited two weeks. I'm not gonna get the call. I come back home. I have the flu. I lose like five pounds because I really can't eat. Just when I break the flu, like I break, like I'm still. I feel better. I get a call and then they want me there. When they called me, they wanted me there five minutes after they called me. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's when they wanted me there. Yep. This is how hectic it can be once you get a call and somebody wants you. It doesn't matter where you're at. If they say, hey, we got a spot for you, you drop everything and you go. That's how perseverance. That's perseverance, and it's going to show, do you really want this? So I dropped everything, and I went off, and I went, and I went off, and I took my flight out. Still, still feeling sick. I'm, my flu's gone, but I'm still feeling sick because I'm recovering. And I get there. Get there, spend um, two weeks with the team. I did very well the first week um had a hitting streak going on and then we went home and then I um I pooped the bed <laughs> and an indie ball is very cutthroat if you don't go if you have three three to four games where you're not hitting and I'm meaning you're not striking out but you're not getting the hits that you need to get or you're not driving the ball like you need to and that's the reason why they got you up there they're gonna release you I was surprised that they kept me as long as they did after, after for some reason, I wasn't hitting the ball. My at-bats were good, but I just was hitting everything into the ground. And then manager called me in and said, hey, they got to release me. And I was on a team that was contending. Wow. All my managers, all my managers, um, I've had three managers, um, played three years, had three managers. I respect every single one of them. Every single one of them. Not, I, I mean, of course, there's bad things I could say about them if I wanted to, but I mean, the bad things I probably could say about it is just on a personal level, as in, they're like, they're like older brothers to me. <laughs> like that seriously is it? Like, if like the type of stuff that you would just say, oh, I don't like this certain thing about him, but rather than that, that's my boy. That's how it is with my managers. I respect every single one of them. And I have nothing bad to say because they actually saw something in me. And um, I'm going to go to where you can't burn bridges with some of these guys that you have because you really don't know who these guys may become friends with or get to know why you're still playing ball. Because they may say, oh, I know a guy, hey. And they may call you up and say, hey, yeah, you know about Caleb? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's that? It's like, oh yeah, this guy he plays with me. He has a good attitude, probably a good clubhouse guy. Hey, if once he's on, he's on. So we're gonna see about him. It's like, all right, give him a call. It's like, all right, give me a call. 
all happen. That's the type of stuff that really can happen with some of these things. You don't have to, you don't have to, um, excuse my language, you don't have to kiss ass. You don't have to. But just have an organic, and I mean it like that, have an organic uh, relationship with somebody. Just let it, let the relationship actually happen with those two. Well, let, uh, let me rephrase that. Relationship happen with the people that are helping you out or are giving you a chance. It doesn't have to be all buddy buddy, but they may see something in you and be like, all right, we got to let you go. Or, hey, keep on doing this. We're still looking out for you. And they actually will do that. Believe it or not, they will. It may not be then and there because, in the, I mean, nowadays, hey, we want everything to be, hey, right now, right then. Um, when, I got the, when I got the call for, to go to Napa for spring training, I hit up the manager. I didn't think he was going to keep, I didn't think he was going to hit me back. Three weeks later, he hits me back and wants to get more info on me. So I send him my information and he tells me, all right, we'll invite you. You're not going to be one of the guys that we'll have for um, the host families, but from, it just so happens from one of my friends. And this is another thing. Baseball can help you out with a lot of the friends that you meet with, that you play with because they can vouch for you if you actually are good. And one of my friends vouched for me and says, okay, well, we'll do that. And just that you'll just have to have a place to, you have to find a place to stay and have your own vehicle so you can commute, but you can come to the spring training and win a spot. I was like, that's fine. And that's all that I need. I need the opportunity. Um, but that was, um, this was this path a few months ago. I'm telling y'all about, I'm going to get to that. Now I'm going to fast forward over to uh, 2018. Went to the Empire again because um, one of the one of the places I thought I was going to play at fell through because the guy who I thought was going to be the general manager who invited me, he didn't get the job. So that's also something that can happen. Went to spring training in the Empire again. They showed no interest again. Got released. And I was thinking, okay, well, I got released. It's whatever. I'm looking at one of the other managers for the teams tells me about one of the other teams. They're having a losing streak. I'm talking about like 10 game losing streak. So I hit the man, I hit that manager up. I got his number from that, from that uh, other manager that I was first contacted and I hit him up and he didn't really know me, but he liked what I was saying. And he liked what he saw from the videos that I had. I sent that. So I kept in contact with them. That's something that you have to do. It's something if you're trying to get somewhere, it's not about bugging the person. It's about keeping in contact with them and not always asking them, Hey, do you still have a spot? I seriously was just taught. I was just shooting the breeze with them every time I was talking with them. And I learned to do that with age, shooting the breeze with a manager or a coach will make it a lot better and easier to speak with them because they can just speak with you like a regular person. They don't have to treat you like you're a number or just another baseball player. They can treat you as if you're one of their friends. And we're human. That, that's something that um, in baseball that even though that going through the different levels of ball, it'll start becoming a job, of course, when you get into – competitive ball from 14 age 14 and up but we're still human if a co if if I can have a coach like actually be friends with me and I can respect them in, in that sense then of course I'm going to be friends with them and all that but I also want them to be straight up with me if I mess up if I mess up or if I do something or what I can work on so I can help myself get better. And that's why I say the last three managers, I really respect them because that's what they did. Now, it happened again, um, coming to the last two weeks of the season over in the Empire. That, man, that same manager, I'm thinking that it's not going to happen. Um, I had to talk with God about it. Also, keep God in your life about a lot of these things. 
he works in ways that you're just like, I can't believe this worked out, but thank you so much. It really does work out like it. I talked with God about it. When I talked with him about it, something that one of my really good friends told me about, sometimes you have to demand things of God. You can't just ask all the time. Sometimes you have to demand it. And some people said that, hey, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not telling y'all to do this now. This is just me. I'm not telling y'all to do this. But um, I, <laughs> I cussed out God because I was that upset. I was very upset. I wasn't in a dark place, but I was very upset because it didn't make any sense why guys who I believe that I was better than, especially with hitting, why I'm not there playing right now. So I went went to the facility that was at um, the facility I work at in Natchez, is Double Play Academy. Um, shout out to them, and I really thank them for letting me be one of the instructors there and me and allowing me to use their facility. So I really appreciate them. Um, Sean, if they're watching, Sean McDonald, thank you for that. So really want to say thank you for it. But after one of the nights I worked out and I'm coming home. I get a text from the VP of the league who was talking with the manager. He said, where are you at? Are you still playing? I text back, no, I'm not playing anywhere. Texting me back. So do you want to play? So I called him. I was like, what you talking? I seriously said, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> That's exactly what I told him. Because the, um, the VP is really cool. Um, his name, um, his name's Jerry Gonzalez. He played for the, he played for the Angels organization when he was younger. He was a uh, second baseman. But, um, so I asked him about it. He's a really cool guy. Um, he said, well, we need you here 10 minutes ago. I was like, what? It's like, yes. It's like, okay, that's a bet. <laughs> dedication, going back to the dedication and doing what it takes so that you can get where you want to. At this point, I'm about to go, I told you about my family and all that, my family background and my family um, foreign. I have family all around the world. I have family in almost every continent, which is weird. <laughs> but I have family in almost every continent except Antarctica and uh, South America. Antarctica and South America. So they're all coming for a family reunion to a place, if you heard of, Hilton Head, South Carolina. We um, started to have our um, family time there every um, summer. I'm supposed to be meeting my mother and my sister to go fly out to Hilton Head the next, in, in the next two days. I have to call my mother to tell her this. My mother almost disowned me from the family. Let me tell you this. This is baseball now. My family knows that I will put baseball over my family. I'm not saying anybody should do this, but that's the single mindedness that I had to get myself so I can try to get myself to the major league and do whatever it takes the right way. And the reason why I say the right way, because had many people offer me steroids, had many people offer me PEDs, and they already saw my body size and all that. They had people offer me HGH, and I told them, if I can't make it like this, man, then what's the point of me even taking that stuff? Because I, I learned to always look forward and look at the big picture of what possibly could happen if I take this stuff, the consequences of that. Is that going to shorten my career or not? And I'd rather not do that. I'd rather do it the correct way. And the reason why I say that is if baseball was meant to be used to use performance enhancing drugs, then Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens would be in the Hall of Fame. Only these guys that were Hall of Famers who used them, they would be in the Hall of Fame right now. But they're not because of that, because they cheated. It sucks that they did because they were still good without that. But I'm not a big leaguer, so me as a big leaguer, I mean, me as an independent player, 
Mm-hmm. I'm not a big leaguer to know what all they have to go through and all the things that all the pressure that they're going through, especially if they're a big name, what pressures they have to go through so that they can stay where they're at and stay at that. I mean, if you're one of the top set, if you're one of the 700 that are playing in the major league, you're one, you're one of the top, you're one of the top in the world. It's, it's no doubt. That's, that's just it. That's just it. You're one of the top in the, you're one of the top in the world. So that's a lot of pressure if you really think about it. And I can't even imagine the guys, the pressure, the guys that aren't even, that aren't the big names, but yet they're on that cusp of going back to triple A or double A or staying in the big league. I can't even imagine the pressures they're going through. And yet all these people are having pressures in indie ball and minor league ball. So it's, can you tell That's the difference? Right. Between, can you give the difference between an affiliate ball and independent ball? Like, you know, tell the difference between an independent player, ball player, minor league, and an affiliate ball player. Okay, I got you on that. Okay, so an affiliate um, minor league player. I'm a, from my experiences and people I've met is consistency. A hundred percent consistency because, sorry about this, I'm trying to make sure that my phone doesn't die. There we go. Um, and this is from me hitting with uh, guys who are in the minor leagues. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking about like um, talent level. I'm talking about, okay. on, I'm just talking about not, you know, like for my listeners listening on here, most of some of them won't know the difference between what an independent minor league ball player is and an affiliate minor league ball player. So I want you to kind of go okay. on that level, on a micro level. You okay. Know? Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay, so everybody knows that um, major league ball has thirty clubs and they have their farm teams, which are um, goes from AAA. I'm going down. So my major league team, you have the big the big club, the major league team. You have the AAA team, the AA team. Then you have the three A's. The reason why I say the three A's, you have low A, which is regular on uh, single A ball. You have high A, which is what some will call advanced A. It's a higher level of single A ball. And you have short season, which is uh, short A ball. Short A ball, of course, is um, is some people, if, they, you, if you don't know, usually comes from kids who come out of college. They're doing uh, playoffs in college, and then they go – they get drafted, then they go play short season. And then below that, you have rookie ball. Now, there's four main leagues um, in indie ball that are in a federation. And the top one is the Atlantic League. The Atlantic League is AAA level baseball. Um, he and I were talking about it. If you know who Nook Logan is, um, he used to be the fastest man in baseball. Um, and when I mean, he used to be the fastest man in baseball. He can attest to this that the man was, the man was fast, fast, fast. <laughs> and when he got released, he played in the Atlantic League, which were, were for the Long Island Ducks in the Atlantic League. Um, so we're gonna do it. We're gonna do um, parallels to it. So Atlantic League is like Triple A ball. Then you have the American Association and the Can-Am League. It's the Canadian American um, Professional Baseball League. Can-Am League and the American Association are equivalent to double-A ball. Then you have the Frontier League. The Frontier League is as low as level of the Four Federation League. Can-Am, uh, the Frontier is equivalent to high, to high A or advanced A single-A ball. Then you have the two leagues that are right under the front, that are between the Frontier and the Pecos and Empire League. You have the Pacific Association, which is equivalent to short season, to low A ball. The reason why I say short season, because our season is only 80 games. So that's why I consider it the short season. Then you have the United Shores uh, Professional Baseball League. It was a new league, but now it's on game. A lot of favor, it's in Michigan. And that one is equivalent to, um, so I would put that equivalent to like low A ball. So those are the equivalents to what 
American independent baseball is. Does that kind of answer your question right there? Yeah, yeah. No, nah, that's yeah, that's good information. I didn't I didn't know a lot some of these things myself. So yeah. I just Oh yeah, it's uh it's, it's something that um it's just because I've been around I've been around a lot of guys, uh I've been around the right people to know the equivalence to whatever because some guys when they walk away from ball they say they just want to say they play professional ball. Um I just don't want to play professional ball and I really hope that most guys out there, which unfortunately it's a small percentage when I'm when I'm talking about it. My goal isn't just to play professional ball. My goal is to play major league ball and be an impact player in the major leagues. If I get to the major leagues before I'm 30, I'm 27 at the at, at right now, just to let people know. But if I'm able to make it to the major leagues in that short amount of time before I'm 30, and hopefully become an impact player, then that will, that will be sat, that will be satisfaction for me. Mm. And that's how I see it. Now you, um, I want to go back to, um, certain things and I just want to kind of, um, you know, you, you, you said, uh, you, you've said a lot about getting, you know, you just kind of passed over the releases and, you know, you just kept telling year upon year, but man, you know, um, a lot of people don't understand the perseverance and adversity that goes along with this. And you're not, you're, you're, you're essentially, you know, we talked about this and I don't take offense to this. It's just, it's the reality. Okay. It, I hope you won't, but um, you know, you're essentially a long shot to AKA make it, you know what I'm saying? And you are, you, you here you are a smart dude with a master's degree um, can very easily have you have all the reasons to walk away, but you continue to want to strive and just for the chance to, you know, like you just said, to step and be in the big leagues. Why can you explain? I mean, I know you talked about your family and stuff like that, but how, what, 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 what is, what is, what is it in you that is making you keep going? You know what I'm saying? You're, you're talking about host families and driving out and going to California on your, on your own dime and, and paying money and, and, you know, what is it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, what most people will look at me, they think I'm crazy, which I think most baseball players are, they have a little, they're a little eccentric in their own ways. But really what drives me, uh, it's a little story that my mom told me when I was younger. I saw the Yankees playing when I was younger. I think I was uh, four years old, three or four years old. And I saw my mother get excited about it. And I liked how I'm, I remembered that when she told me, I liked how the guys, it was a home run somebody hit. I liked the celebration of what was going on and all that. And from that day on, I wanted to play major league ball. And I told my mother, I want to do what those guys do. And really what drives me it's not just, it's not about just not giving up. I truly believe that I have the skill and the talent and the know-how to play a full major league season. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take advantage of every opportunity that I have. That's the main thing. I'm gonna take advantage of every opportunity that I have. And because, because I, I seriously have done a lot more than a lot of people have done in their lifetimes, just outside of baseball. Outside of baseball, I've done a lot of things that a lot of people haven't done in their lifetime. I mean, I played it, and because of that, I believe that I have that, I have that right to keep on going forward, keep on going forward, and now everything seems to be going in the right direction. So... Talking about it, because I told you before, I want everybody to know. I thought I was about to, I thought I was going to be one of those guys to walk away from the game this past season, 2018. 
when the guy told me to come up, um, I didn't know how I was going to fly up there. I pawned some of my prized possessions so I could get myself a plane ticket to fly up to New York so I can play only for a week and a half. However, that week and a half, I I went to the the team that I was on. It was the it was the last place team. I went up there and I seriously that week and a half I became some sort of like some type of leader because I brought new energy to the squad and I wasn't scared just to go and I didn't care that we were losing. And I think that um, some people get caught up in that. And that's why they fail. Instead of just keep on going out there and battling day in and day out, they get upset about losing. Yes, winning's awesome. But we're not all Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter and Kobe Bryant and those type of elite athletes. They say only winners win and we hate losing. Well, Unfortunately, we're not as blessed as, and the reason why I say as blessed is I'm talking about the situations that they got put into. They got put into winning situations, but when they, when nobody knows about the adversity that those two have ever been through. And I don't think, I don't, I think when they get like really old, that's when they're probably going to talk about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. That's what I'm saying. No, nobody knows the, the adversity that those two went through unless somebody really just watched their careers. But that's something that really has pushed me. I know I kind of went on with that, but does that kind of answer what you asked? Yeah. No, it does, man. So, um, I mean, we're speaking on that, man. I've got a couple more questions, man, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wrap this up. But I wanna, I wanna. We've been talking about this the last few days, talking about the dedication. They're hearing it. They're talking about faith in your comments. They're talking about, you know, they're pulling for you, all right? But, um, you know, as we talk about younger athletes, guys that are, uh, you know, wanting scholarships, wanting to go play in college ball, which you had the opportunity to do. But, you know, some of these, you know, we talk about parents and stuff like that. We're talking about, you know, how tough it is to get, you know, more than an hour and a half to three hours worth of practice in the week and then play on the games. And I'm telling them that they have to be, you know, you have to do more. And here you are now, it's your profession. But again, you can very easily walk away. I guarantee the money is not for the money or anything else in that. But I want to tell tell the people over there, like, what's the normal week of your training schedule before you head out of uh, 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 for, for California? What's the normal week of training, man? What are you doing? All right, so normal week of training. So Sunday, I go through my throwing program. So I had, because like I said before, I had to get my arm stronger. Um, Sundays are easy days. The reason why I say easy days is because I don't have to wake up as early because I'm also an instructor um, back at home. So I wake up probably around 10, go to the facility, and I do my throwing program, which starts, it's probably a 30 to 45-minute thing throwing between heavy and light balls, around 200 throws. I'm not saying any, you have to actually get the throwing program. Don't just do that. You have to actually have like a setup for that. So if anybody wants to try to do that, you actually have to have a program for that. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to get one of those. I do that for about 30, 30 to 45 minutes. Then I do my agility set, my agility drills going from ladders, hurdles, all that. And this is one of my easy days. Agility is ladders and all that probably for another 25 minutes. Then I get about, I do about 100 uh, wall ground balls. And the reason why I say that, I get a tennis ball, I do 100 of those, and I just throw the tennis ball off the wall and I, and I get ground balls for that. Because now I'm an outfielder, but I'm also a utility player. I play outfield, second base, and first base. So I have to work on my infield work as, all, as well as my, um, my outfield work. So I do about 200 ground balls to myself and the footwork. So that's another, so I've already spent around an hour and a half to two hours just doing that. Then I get into my hitting circuit, which I hit about, I hit around maybe 100, 150 balls just to. How many days a week are you doing this? How many days a week are you, you know? 
working out, you know, you know, on this scale? Six days a week. The reason why it's not seven is because you always need a rest day. And I hate rest days because I feel like a bum. <laughs> um, but one, of those days, one of those days is where, though? Where, where do you go every one day a week? So every day, I also have work with my, with my kids, too. When I'm talking about my kids, I have a 10U team that I coach. I'm at the facility probably from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that's from doing my workouts from that 10 a, from that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Have an hour of rest to go eat. Then I come back and I have lessons throughout the day. I'm getting to what I'm I'm about to get to. Every Wednesday since December. Every Wednesday, I've been going to uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, it's about five and a half hours away from me. Um, I've been going to Dallas, Texas to do workouts with uh, one of the managers of the Frontier League. His name's Dennis Pelfrey. He's the uh, manager for the Florence Freedom. I got set up with that with a guy named Joe Torrey. He does a little um, workout circuit with a lot of guys um, around the country to help them get looked at by different indie, by different indie teams and different affiliate um, scouts. And um, it's with um, Black Sox baseball. I actually have one of their things on right now. It's on um, Black Sox. It's on BlackSoxProBaseball.com. Uh, so if anybody who is thinking about doing pro ball or doing some stuff like that, um, you can actually look that up if you would like to. But mind you, I said I'm there at the facility until 8 p.m. to 9. I leave there and I drive straight to Dallas to stay at one of my friend's house, which I'm so happy I have a friend that stays there so I can stay at his house so I don't have to use money to get a hotel. And I get there probably around 2.30, 3 a.m., maybe 3.30. This, yes, last night I was there at 3.30. I got there at 3.30 and I went to sleep at 4. I had to wake back up at eight, went back to sleep until 8.30, <laughs> then wake back up again so that we could get ready to drive an hour south. Because when you're in Dallas or in you're in Houston, you go from one part of the city to the other, it takes you about an hour or two hours. Just let anybody know, whoever, if you're not in the big city, that's what happens in big cities. Even when you're going 80 miles per hour the whole time. Um, for our workout and our training at 10 a.m., and we're there until 1 p.m., and that's actually where I just came from, just to let everybody know. So, like, that's um, that's a normal week for me. And so I want to just I want to I want to make sure everybody heard that, okay? So here here's a kid again, all right? He's driving five hours a, a week, one five hours one day a week, getting into Dallas from Mississippi to Dallas. And three or four o'clock in the morning to get right back up at eight or nine to get up for a 10 o'clock workout just to work with this, you know, this, this coach of his. OK, five hours per week, I mean, you know, a, a five hours, one day a week. For whatever off season he's been, you know, how long he's been doing it, man. So I want to I want to I mean, you know, again, this is some of the reasons why, you know, what I'm saying I, I bring people on so you could hear he 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 is just for the love he ain't making no money doing this he's he's obviously it's it's it's, it's actually probably costing it is costing him money to play baseball right oh, yeah. now and yeah, and he's taking it upon himself to like fulfill his dream and giving everything he can and to with a masters to you know, just give every every shot. Like he's a he's epitome of what they say. You got to rip the uniform off of him. And um, so I want to, you know, I want to, you know, say kudos to you. You know, what I'm saying, young brother, because that's 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 a whole. Obviously, you see why he's, you know, everybody could probably tell on here that you can see where his family come from, their background, um, to 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 see why he is got a master's and he's grinding it out. So you know, this guy would be successful. If he makes it to the big leagues, or if he don't, whatever he chooses to do in life, you could tell he gives 110 percent and whatever he chooses to do, which is very, very commendable, man. So, um, you know, I definitely want to say kudos to you, man, for just 
you know, just just grinding it out, man. You know what I'm saying? So when 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 parents and all the, you know, they need to hear and think because they think, you know, they see the money that's being made in the big leagues and they know it's hard. But sometimes, again, I just I said it yesterday, the lack of knowledge is hurting kids. Sometimes they don't understand how hard it is. And, and, and it's funny how you come into the picture and you're telling the stories. But I want I want they need to know how hard even guys that are in the minor leagues right now who are knocking on the door, who are, you know, bonus babies or anything like that. They need to hear this story because there's guys out here like you driving five hours just to get a workout in, driving to California just for a chance to play uh, 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 independent ball. So, um, again, that's kudos to you, man. Um, I'm, I got a few questions in here, all right? And then I'm going to ask you these, and we're going to get up out of here, okay? Hold on one second. All right, then. All right. Um, the plan is in. Yeah, <coughs> work ethic. All right. Bill asks, what's a cross checker? Cross checker. Okay. So you have a national cross checker. I'll go from the regions. You have a regional cross checker. You have a um you have two type of regional cross checkers. The ones that are in say like the southeast, then you have the Midwest and all that. Then you have a national cross checker. They are the head scouts. They're the head scouts. And those are the guys that you want to get in front of. Those are the guys that have signing power. So that's what a cross checker is. All right. Cool. William, uh, he also asked, Caleb, do you think your intellect is one of the problems? A lot of coaches are used to are, are not used to seeing black men with options. I wouldn't say that. Um, it's a yes has crossed my mind. However, usually when I tell my managers about my uh, background, they get surprised. And that's really nothing. That's really nothing against me. It's more like they just pick fun at it. They just pick fun at me. Like if you if you're in a baseball dugout, especially in the professional baseball dugout, somebody's gonna make fun of you. Because <laughs> you're smart, right? You're yeah, smart, just go smart. Right? So yeah. everybody's the same. It's like, I, why are you trying to be all smart and stuff? We know you got a master's. It's like, hey, I'm sorry, bro. Right. Right. So it's, it, I really don't think it has anything for that because, I mean, one of the guys who's, um, I mean, Curtis Grandison, um, if, uh, if you know Curtis, he's, uh, when he was in the minor league, he was studying all the time to make sure he got his bachelor's from Chicago State. And um, it's because of uh, Nick Logan that I, uh, I met Curtis. I met him at a workout I was at down in Florida. And because I knew Nook, we decided to hit together for an hour. And it was, a, it was the best thing ever because I didn't ask him anything about hitting. We were talking about the different food places in Chicago because he's from the Shy. And I have family that um, stay in Chicago up on, uh, if anybody's from Chicago, I have family that stay up um, on the east side, up um, above the zoo on Lakeshore Drive. So we were all talking about that. And I, uh, I don't think the intellect really has anything to like, to like deter from managers. Now, college coaches and possibly high school coaches and stuff like that, that could be a factor. I'm not saying that that truly is, but it really can be a factor because I'll say I'll say it on one thing is um my college coach, my first college coach before he um, stepped down. He was intimidated. My father when he met me and my father, he was intimidated by my father because, like I said, um, even though the coach was from Arkansas, he's from Hot Springs, Arkansas. There's not many black people in Hot Springs, Arkansas. If there are. They're not intelligent. What people would say is intelligent, the stereotype of what people have. And I'm going to speak on this and be, I'm going to be blunt about it. They really think that a lot of us are dumb. And it's, it's unfortunate, but that's how it is. But um, yeah. people who meet my family, um, who have an idea of what Black people are because of stupid stereotypes, they get very intimidated by it. And I do agree with that. 
but in the professional set, I don't believe so. I haven't met that. I haven't dealt with that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I do not believe so in the professional sense, possibly in the college sense, and I would say most likely in the high school sense. All right. Um, Tony says, Caleb, how was the transition from metal to wood bats for you? <laughs> That's a hard question. The reason being because I just went for a wood bat. I just kept hitting. <laughs> uh, Seriously, that's how that's how that's how I felt. That's how I felt from it. Um, because uh, when I went to college, they first started having the BB course, and because I went to NAI school, I don't know if they do it at Division One. I. I know they do it sometimes at junior colleges and um, the other divisions. But we had to hit with wood. My um uh, in the fall, our coach made us hit with wood. So I think when you get to college. I don't suggest it in uh, high school unless you're getting looked at by a team and you're getting drafted in the top 15 round. The reason why I say top 15 round, if you get drafted in the top 15 round out of, out of college, but let me rephrase that. If you get drafted in the top five rounds out of high school, go. <laughs> I always say go. But if that's not for you or anything, I I, I wouldn't say that. But um, back to the question about the – transition from metal to um, wood. I didn't think anything of it, but um, some people, they have trouble with it just because with metal bats, you can swing at anything and not break the bat. You actually have to have a good swing to swing with a wood bat. And that's from other people's experiences rather than mine. Me, I, I just kept hitting. With that okay. nah, well, I like that part. I, um, the... Um... What is this? Um, B Web asks, What's the single most important thing you wish you learned earlier playing baseball? Hmm. I would say the earliest thing that I would have to say would be. Play football. Really? The reason why I say that because um, I was all I was an all sport athlete. I played basketball, football. I played for I didn't start playing football until I got to junior high school, but um, I stopped in I stopped in high school. Um, I wish I would have I wish I would have played football because it would have helped out with my speed even more. And my um, I personally think playing more sports would have helped me out more as a um, as an athlete to transition to different positions earlier in my career. So that's why I say me playing football, because I was a all state soccer player also. And that was just because I was good at soccer. So I kept playing and I liked it. So, <laughs> so that's why I say I would have, I would have played football. I would have been a three sport athlete instead of two sport athlete in uh, high school. And if I would have to say right after that, I would say go to junior college. All right. So play football and go to junior college. All right. Um, did you lift weights in high school? I did. Um, talking about the weight, the weights and all that. I know a lot of kids are thinking about weights and stuff going on through junior high. When I was in junior high school, coming from sixth grade, I went to the gym with my father. I wanted to lift heavy weights. He didn't make me. When you're in junior high, when you're in sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and the reason why I say fifth grade, because there's some of those big kids that are there, but fifth grade, maybe fifth grade, but sixth grade to um, eighth grade, I suggest that you do weight, you do light weights with a lot of reps to help mold the body. You want to mold the body into being toned up because that's what I had to do. I was a Husky kid growing up. I was a Husky kid growing up. So my dad was like, all right, you want to, you want to, you want to get abs? That's what he told me straight up. You want to get abs? I was like, yeah, all right, come to the gym with me. So I'm all happy. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go lift weights. I'm going to look like all these big guys. All right. 
you see those 10 pounds? Yeah, just lift those and always go on the bike. <laughs> so I was always riding the bike. I was riding the bike for like 30 minutes to an hour and just lifting 10 pound weight. And I toned my body up to a, to the extent. And then when I hit puberty, the baby fat shed off me. And then when I got to high school, I just started actually lifting and I, my body seriously not, I mean, I'm just saying facts. It was kind of like an Adonis. It really was like an Adonis. Also, I also say, I suggest a lot of people should, for flexibility, because for baseball, you need a lot of flexibility. Try doing some martial arts. The time I was getting looked at by the Braves at that time, I was doing martial arts, uh, Okinawan Kempo. And that really, and me as a catcher, it really helped me out because it helped with my flexibility as a catcher because I had to learn how to do a split. <clears throat> one of the worst feelings ever, especially as a man, one of the worst feelings ever. But at that time, I could do a full split because if I couldn't, then I was going to get kicked in the head by my sensei, and I didn't like that. <laughs> no. Yeah, they. Uh, that's a good. I mean, that's a good tip right there. I like that. I um, I wanted to um. All right. So listen, that's the questions I got today. Um, before you head out. All right, Kayla, before we head out together, mm -hmm. um, what's your last, you know, tips, advice, or something that you want to um, give to the parents and the players that are listening on right now to the show, um, you know, that you just, you know, that's on your heart, man, and finish it up, all right? One of the last things I would like to say to the parents primarily the parents, parents of younger kids. Let the kids have fun with it. I, it may be, they may be very serious with everything, but what uh, D was talking about, about being relatable, you have to think about what you really wanted when you were younger at that point, at your age, or the point where you really wanted something and when it started to become fun. You want your kids not to think of it more as a job. You want them to do it because they want to, not because they have to. I wanted to play ball. That's the reason why I kept doing it. I want to do that. I wanted to do all those things. I had the reason why I wasn't as in much trouble, and the reason why I say much trouble because I was a teenager. <laughs> Every teenager gets in trouble. <laughs> but it's because I just, I wanted to be better at my sport, at my craft. In any sport I was in, I wanted to be better because I wanted to be the best. Because what do the best players do? They can get away with things in school. This is, now this advice I'm giving y'all is actually, it's very true. So take it how you like it. When you're good at sports, and you keep your grades up, you get to get away. And I mean that in that sense. Good at sports while keeping your grades up, you get to get away with a lot of things at school because of what can the teachers say? They can't say anything if you have good grades. What can the coach say to you? Just don't be, don't be an a-hole. <laughs> but you'll be able to do a lot more things, and plus you'll be able to show a leadership skill. So that's really what I can say is um, have, let them have fun with that and w let them want and see if they – and also make sure that they want to play and make sure that they want to keep on going forward. Because it's really all about the kids. You can't force the kids to do things. I mean, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna break them like that. You, you can't do it. I, I coach a 10-U team. I know how some of these kids are. I know how a lot of, a lot of these kids are because I see it every day. And I tell them, it's like, people are upset because it. And I was like, you can't force them to do things. You can't force people to do stuff. You know what happened with slavery, right? Yeah. You can't mm -hmm. force people to do that. That's why um, uprisings and stuff happen <laughs> and all that other stuff. Right. Right. <laughs> You're absolutely right, though, man. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But uh, so listen, man. 
Listen, man, pleasure meeting you, man. Pleasure. I mean, you, you know, behind the scenes, I definitely be staying in touch and rooting you on, man. Um, this is what perseverance is about, man. It's just, you know, and it's, and it's, I just, it's just good to hear stories like this um, of just guys that, you know, are just doing it for the straight love. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it is a grind. And so when people say it's a grind to make it and all of that, you know, everybody wants to get the scholarships and get being a big leagues and, and, and please don't, don't ever like shortcut that dream and just think that, you know, I ain't never here to shoot that down, but I just want you to see certain stories uh, behind the scenes of certain guys, there are different avenues, there are different ways, there are different highways that it takes to get to their ultimate dreams. And, you know, Caleb, again, you know, more props to you, brother. Just keep grinding it out, man. And, um, you know, I thank you for coming on. I thank you for sharing your story and um, inspiring people, letting people, you know, let, letting parents know how hard it is, how, you know, how much you got to love what you do, you know what I'm saying? All the sacrifices, the education aspect, you know, um, you know, all of that, all of that and be up, you know, and above, man. So uh, more props to you, young brother. Keep going and keep grinding. Um, you need me for anything. I'm here um, again. So um, let's, uh, you know, no, no doubt about it, man. I, you know, I got plenty of new fans over here, at least on my side, I know, especially, um, you know, they all talk about keep grinding and, you know, they're rooting for you. They're, um, you know, ultimate sacrifices being made and everything like that. So you don't just made new friends and, and fans out here, which is all, all, you know, all important, man. So, um, I appreciate it from all y'all for real. All right. So that's my time. So tomorrow I'm going to share another story on the other end, trying to lock them in time wise, but, um, um, tomorrow I'll be joined by, um, another minor leaguer. I'm, um, uh, with the Royals right now and try to bring him on tomorrow. Um, so we need to, uh, you know, Bill says he wants to check, you know, check back in with you during the season, bring you back on, man. And Corey says, keep the grind up. And Mr. Porch is out there. New York says, God bless you, man. Um, so, um, Sterling says, you got this, bro. And uh, what's up, John? What's going on, baby? And uh, so, yeah, you, again, plenty of fans out here rooting for you, young brother. So go ahead and just just, just keep grinding, man. And um, anyway, tomorrow, uh, we're going to keep going. Monoliga, um, Rudy Martin tomorrow. And then Friday, I got D3 uh, Vassar College coach out of New York, uh, head coach. We tentatively are going to change times on Friday. We're going to confirm but he should be on on Friday. So we're just going to keep the knowledge going. Um, keep spreading that, that word. And, you know, we get inspirational stories like my man Caleb today, man. So I want to say peace, young brother. Keep going. All right. I appreciate you. All right, man. You take care. All right. All right, guys. Love you guys, man. I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Peace and love, man. I appreciate you, man. All right. Take care, Caleb, man. Keep grinding, hey, brother. You too.